Hi, everybody, and welcome to this LSE Inclusion Initiative event that is joint with the Special Olympics Inclusion of Global Talent. I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to the virtual LSE campus. I am Dr. Grace Lorden. I am an Associate Professor in Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics, and I'm the founding director of the Inclusion Initiative. Um, the event that we have today is truly global because my participants are scattered all over the globe, from here in Britain, all the way over to the US. In addition to that, we have a range of people who work in the Special Olympics in leadership roles who are going to talk to us about their experience of leadership roles and give us some expertise about how we can be more welcoming of global talent just like them into our organizations. Um, in alphabetical order, I'd first like to welcome um, Kira Byland, who is a Special Olympics GB board member. Um, she's an athlete leader and a double, triple world gold medal cyclist. Kira has been recognized as part of the Queen's Birthday Honours and awarded a British Empire Medal for her services to sport. Welcome to the LSE today, Kira. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's been absolutely fabulous. So, yeah, as you said, I'm Kira. I'm 24 years old and I have an intellectual disability. My special Olympic sports are cycling, swimming, and horse riding. I'm a qualified level two cycle coach, level one, two, three bikeability instructor. I'm a level two track cycle coach and a level two swimming teacher. And as you mentioned, I have the honor of having many different roles as Special Olympics as an athlete leader. I'm a Special Olympics Great Britain board member and vice chair of the athletic team. I'm the chairperson of the Special Olympics Great Britain, Special Olympics Europe and Eurasia Athlete Leadership Council. I'm also the vice chair and health liaison on the Global Athlete Leadership Council. I'm a global health messenger and Special Olympics International Consultant. And last but not least, I am a lion. Welcome, Kira. Thank you for being here today. Um, next, I will introduce um, Nasha Deera. Nasha, welcome to the LSE Virtual Campus. Nasha holds several leadership roles with Special Olympics. Chairperson of the Congress is on the Special Olympics International Board of Directors and is a global health messenger. Nasha is an accomplished short and long distance runner and astoundingly in Zimbabwe, he holds an impressive record of 17 gold medals, six silver medals and one bronze medal. Thank you so much, Nasha, for being here today. Um, next, we have um, Kester Edwards, who has held many leadership roles in the Special Olympics and is currently the manager of sport and development at Special Olympics in Washington. Kester is known as a sports innovator who played a pivotal role in bringing an endurance sport, open water swimming, to Special Olympics. Welcome, Kester, from the US. Um, Kester. And last, but definitely not least, welcome Heidi from Canada, who is an athlete, a golfer, a bowler, in addition to a number of other sports. Over the past years, Heidi has held many leadership roles, including serving on the Special Olympics Canada Athletes Leadership Council and as part of the Global Athlete Leadership Council. And Heidi is known for giving voice to people who aren't necessarily in the room. Welcome to the LSC, Heidi. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just going to give a, a few comments, if that's OK. Absolutely. Um, I just want to explain a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Heidi Mallet. I'm from Prince Edward Island, Canada, and I'm also, I have been living independently for the past 18 years. I've been involved with Special Olympics for the past 15 years. Uh, my favorite sport is golf, and I also participate in uh, bhaji, <clears throat> snowshoeing, and uh, uh, anyway, and uh, I also am the comedian uh, PDI board representative and the Comedian Athletes Leadership Council. And I'm also the chair of the Golco Athletes Leadership Council representing the North American region. And it's important for me to, to advocate because, <clears throat> excuse me for my voice frogging up, uh, to advocate on behalf of all disabilities because uh, not all of them are able to work in the workforce or have the capabilities to. And, uh, and some of the uh, things that are issued uh, that are uh, affecting them from doing that is because there's a lack of uh, transportation and 
uh, uh, education and training and uh, accessibility. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Kira, I'm going to start with you. And for the people who are listening today, I'm hoping that you can outline the difference between the Special Olympics and the Paralympics. I sure can. And that is not a problem at all. So basically, the differences between them all is, let's start with the Olympics. The Olympics is aimed at non-disabled athletes who compete at elite level for their country and they also have Olympic Games every four years. You have the Paralympics and it's aimed at disabled athletes predominantly with and are visual impairment who also compete at elite level for their country and they have a Games every four years. Then you have the Special Olympics for athletes with an intellectual disability we have a divisioning process, and this is to enable athletes of all abilities to compete in a like-for-like -like way. That's what I like to call a fair playing field. And we also have a World Games every four years, but we also offer an all-year-round sports training. The Special Olympics might just be seen as sports, but we are much more than that. We're about inclusion through our communities, health, education, and unified. As we're an athlete-led organization, we enable our athletes to develop the leadership skills in many different roles. For example, becoming a coach, an athlete council member, a board member, a consultant, through to global messengers, even officials. All of this helps us to build up our skills in many different ways. I could tell you so much more about the amazing things we do, but I have to save that for another time. Thank you so much for bringing up um, the Special Olympics as an ambassador for inclusion in the workplace more generally. So Kester, if I can ask you, how does sport and the Special Olympics play a role in developing inclusive communities? Um, thank you, Grace. Um, first, I believe the community needs to see the ability of the person. Second, the community needs to see the person. And once you, once we come to see the person first, we, we also can accept the ability of the person within the community. For me, my example is that seeing a number of Special Olympics athletes first starting in open water swimming, it was a challenge for anyone to embrace taking folks and people with intellectual development disability from the pool into the open water. That was very scary for the community and for the Special Olympics community. But the Special Olympics athlete needed to show where, I've, where we have in Special Olympics ability, age, and gender. And the ability came out. And we it, were able to show the community that no, we belong in the same playing field as everyone else. And we have the ability, the determination to complete any race that we set out to do. So for me, the community open water helps me to see that through sport, how the community was first resent, was, was resistant against inclusion. But now after many years, open water swimming and Special Olympics athletes now are showing the world that we belong in open water swimming. So this is one way that I see the community was changed through sports. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Kester. And for people who are listening, if you want to ask my panelists questions, please do put them in the chat box. After our discussions, I will come and look and, and ask your questions to the panel also. Um, Heidi, can I ask you, why is it important to give people with intellectual and developmental disabilities leadership opportunities in business and organizations? It is important to give uh, people uh, with IDD opportunities to contribute and because they can be, they can lead in many different uh, roles, leadership roles, and they can be involved in both uh, boards and committees, as well as employment opportunities. 
And they can also have the skills and learn to uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can build their uh, leadership skills and confidence and will help uh, empower the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities so that they can live their day-to-day -day life and help them find the voice that, uh, that they can use and to speak up for themselves and also be a voice for those who can't speak up for themselves because it is important for them to give them their uh, feedback and opinions. Fantastic. And so if we're thinking about hiring more people with IDD, Nasha, can I ask you, what should organizations do to prepare to hire and include people with IDD? Grace, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, what organization or companies should do to hire people with uh, disabilities, intellectual dis intellectual development disability, is whereby uh, having partnership and working with those organization who have got people with intellectual disability or intellectual development disability. For example, Special Olympics, uh, it really helps those companies to get to know about the uh, those people, it also helps those companies and organizations to interact, to create long lasting partnership that will lead to more inclusive uh, workplaces. For example, knowing characters and behaviors with the IDD, at the end of the day, we create an inclusive uh, unified leadership at workplaces whereby probably sometimes companies might not know the behaviors because they've got, uh, they've got that uh, the fear of unknown how to work with people with somebody with IDD, but working with those companies, working with those uh, organizations, for example, a, a good initiative that has been done by uh, this network with London School of Economics and Special Olympics, it really helps a lot because uh, those stereotypes, those discrimination, who, and those fear of unknown will be broken, those barriers will be bro broken down because now we have got that same sense of belonging, same sense of we are on the same knowledge, knowing how our work do, because uh, out there companies and organizations, they don't know like people with IDD can do something at workplace, they can, they have got the vast potential and talents that lies within them. As you can see, Special Olympics has done a lot to people with IDD, including myself and other panelists on this uh, on this call. And uh, we have got some amazing talents. Apart from that, we are doing work that is amazing. So many people and silencing the doubters out there. Thank you. Nasha, can I can I continue what you said? So the you, you mentioned that you're doing so much amazing work within the Special Olympics by including people who have intellectual and development disabilities. Can you say more about what is the benefit of such a diverse workforce? Thank you so much. Uh, the benefit uh, of uh, uh, for example, it, it it improves employee work ethic. So if, in Special Olympics, finding dedicated employee is difficult. And uh, Special Olympics athletes, whenever they are employed, uh, they are so loyal, they are so committed when it comes to when it comes to doing their work because they've got that vigor and passion to do work whenever they are employed. So it will be a great benefit to the companies, to the organization, because uh, uh, because their their skills and uh, the skills of the diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much for that. Um, and Heidi, sticking with people who are working in organisations, I know that you've been an advocate for many people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities working in organisations. So can I ask you? Do you have any suggestions for people who want to welcome a new team member who has IDD into their organization? I think it is important for people who do not have intellectual and developmental disabilities to uh, go out and meet people with intellectual and developmental disabilities because they're just like everyone else. 
they are uh, they want to build that relationship with you, and also that will help build their confidence. Uh, some may be shy. Uh, most, I think, are shy. But if you start the conversation and find out what's in common, and maybe some of the same things that are in common with you, then you start that friendship together and get to know each other. And also, it, it is important because they want to be uh, involved in groups and be participants in the social aspects of some life. And that's not just in uh, employment, that's in sports, that's in every day to day life. And uh, all the things that are around it, they want to be just like you and I, and we want to participate in the community, whether it's going out, uh, uh, out to play games or whether it, it's going socializing or out to dinner. That's all part of being a part of the community. And in the, uh, I forgot to say earlier, in a world setting, uh, the opportunities are challenging because uh, we do not have the full access like we do in a city like transportation and so forth. So that sometimes that's a challenge. And uh, therefore, it, uh, it also can be done in a world setting as well where you can access to make friends together. Am I, hear, am I hearing you right as well, Heidi, that for employers, simple things like providing transport for employees can be a way to remove barriers to allow greater participation? Yes, because transportation is a big issue, especially in rural settings, because we do not have public transit systems. Fantastic. Um, Kester, I have a question for you, but before I read it, I also have a message from you from Eva Gazova, who is saying, Dear Kester, we are looking forward to welcoming you in Slovakia for the Special Olympics European Triathlon Competition. Thank you for coming. So do you want to do you want to tell us what you're going to be doing when you go to Slovakia? Thank you. Um, so <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, um, so part of my uh, Special Olympics duty um, develop working in the sports sports area. I have been working on triathlon over the last two world games. We had triathlon in Los Angeles in 2015 and in Berlin and sorry, and in uh, at Abu Dhabi in 2019. And we will have triathlon in Berlin in 2023. So Slovakia is going to be having the triathlon with a, a joint triathlon. As we talk about inclusion. Um, part of my what we are doing is having Special Olympics athletes join in an existing race. So instead of creating this triathlon event, what we do, we athletes who are who have the potential and the ability to compete in triathlon, like a 700, like a sprint triathlon, um, they will be competing in a sprint triathlon in Slovakia. So that's what we're doing. We'll be um, competing with another organization we'll be having six country six countries and about 20 about 15 or 20 wow. 20 something athletes competing in this um first um competition with a triathlon group called um challenge family wishing you the absolute best of luck in Thank the competition you. um so the question that i have for you is you're known in the special olympics for being an innovator so you've already mentioned um, some of the innovations that you've um, brought to the Special Olympics. And I'm wondering if you could draw on your expertise and give advice to people in our audience and help them innovate in their own workplaces also. Um, sure. I think one of the things for me, um, <laughs> thank you for seeing me as an innovator. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's that coming from having, first, I was diagnosed with intellectual disability in the early 90s. And not born in with not born with a disability, but having a disability through an accident, and then going to school with people with intellectual disability. I think I was put in a position in life where I was able to to be in both worlds: a person who does not look like they have intellectual disability, and a person who went who live and who lived the life of a person with intellectual disability. So I was always able to see what people with intellectual disability need, or what they didn't have. And growing up in a country like Trinidad and Tobago, I didn't have certain things in the Special Olympics world. So being in this position and in, in having a job in SOR in Special Olympics International and having a position, I see a lot of things that 
Special Olympics athletes need, like first, like the shoes, a shoes program I was doing, this was seen at least changing shoes out at a basketball game. And I was like, that got to stop. Because in this time and age, we can't have athletes doing that. It doesn't really look hygiene and it doesn't look well. And this was one of the ways that I was able to work with a company who had a mission for doing social response, who have a social responsibility platform as well and wanted to give back shoes to Special Olympics athletes. So I was able to work with that company and bring them close to Special Olympics. And we were able to donate shoes at Austria Games in 2017 and 7,000 pairs of shoes in um, 2019. So I think companies need to be looking at the social responsibility. I think folks need to be looking at how companies can give back to Special Olympics athletes because some of them do not have jobs and they are competing in Special Olympics. Some of them, so the family doesn't have the money to buy a shoes or buy the, the outfit for competing. So I think what I would, the advice or the, the suggestion is if you can work with a company who can provide five, five t-shirts and a pants to give this to someone in a, a program, that's really bringing dignity to those individuals with ID. So now they have the proper outfit to compete and to, to training. So I, that's what I feel companies and organizations need or individuals need to be working with organizations to give back. Fantastic. I really, I really agree with you. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that. What, what, what we want to kind of capture today are, are barriers that um, people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities face when they're in the workforce and also on their career journey. Um, and I'm going to ask Kira, if you think about the journey, it really does begin at school or it begins in university. And I'm wondering what specifically can universities like the London School of Economics, where you are today, or schools that have secondary school, um, secondary school kids or high school, do to be more inclusive of talent with intellectual and developmental disabilities? Yeah, thank you, Grace. So for me, inclusion isn't just something that should happen once or every now and again. It needs to be a continual process. So let's start with policies, practices, and procedures. I'll give you one personal example for me. So Whilst I was at college, even though I got extra time to help me in exams, I couldn't actually read the analog clocks on the wall and the support staff were not allowed to prompt me. I wasn't allowed to take my phone in, iPad or watch. So what could have made the situation better is if the college would have provided me with a color coded timer that was put on the computer. It gives me control, independence and equal opportunity. I struggle to write assignments, so it sounds great in my head, but then when I try and put it on paper, it just doesn't really make sense. So being able to submit my assignments in different ways actually helped me pass my course. I know other athletes who use a voice activated app because they can't read lengthy documents, but what they really do prefer is to have a Zoom or Teams call to talk it through. When I was at, co when I started college, I was asked to sign a code of conduct, the expectations, like everybody else was. But because it wasn't in an easy read version, I struggled to understand what I was signing. Do your university have an easy read versions of policies and procedures so students can understand in a format that suits them best? Inclusion sounds so easy, but it's not. It's a long term thinking outside the box approach and needs to adapt and change as it's needed. After all, none of us are the same. What do you do to help get the best from your students? I would start at the very beginning, even before a visit. Do you have a 360 degree virtual tour? That would really certainly have helped me. And do you enable students to submit assignments in a variety of ways that suits their needs? For example, YouTube recordings, recorded presentations, verbally, mind maps and podcasts, rather than being what's easier for the member of staff and being about what best suits the student for them to shine. And do you have a mentoring program where you can really match the student to the mentor rather than who's available? 
And just out of interest, do you have analog clocks in your university? I'm a capable young woman who can achieve if given the right support, but even I don't know what I need until I need it. I struggle to imagine things, so I have to have the experience in order to learn. How responsive and adaptive can you be when change or support is needed? I'd like to leave you with one question. If someone wanted to attend your university like me or one of my fellow effort leaders, speakers, what could you do to ensure to get the very best from us to achieve and be really included? Thank you so much for that, Kira. And can I ask you if you can put yourself back being in the situation where you were looking for the different clock, you would have liked to have submitted your assignments with voice recordings. Was there any way where, where you could give that feedback easily? I, I know some students do have like a check-in with the tutor and things like that. So they could do it by that way. And we do surveys. So at the end of your year or how long your course is, you can usually put in a survey and say, I'm not really keen about this or that went well. So you could do it, but it's difficult sometimes to kind of explain to people, especially because I know that we're all busy, but sometimes just taking a little bit of time out of the course just to have a conversation with somebody is so much easier because emails and texts and things can be taken in different ways that you don't really want it to come across as. And also they're very easy to kind of get lost if it's on a thread of email. So there was different ways, but even in that, of two only ways you could do it, I'm sure they could have thought of more. It sounds to me that the mentoring program that you described as one of the things that you would like people to implement and the mentor matching, is really important so that people have somewhere to go and have conversations about what their individual barriers might be. It is, but it's also like you said, matching them up because if somebody's doing a course, let's say for sports, and they need a mentor, but the only person who's available is in business, it 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 doesn't quite work yeah. because if you're struggling with work and you want somebody to come and help you with it, well, if they don't understand what the topic is or the subject matter is, then how can they help that person who needs help if they don't understand it? And it can be quite, you know, complicated. That's why it's really important to find out what that person is doing, where their strengths are and the things that they need help with, then finding somebody who is in that same department or actually knows a subject matter to then come and help you than just somebody who isn't because then they'd be like oh I don't know and you're like great <laughs> I'm here for help thank you so much and I could I couldn't absolutely agree with you more um so we're getting questions coming in from the audience so um kind of inspired by what I've asked Kira to all panel members um Odessa Hamilton is asking what are the type of adjustments that could practically help increase the number of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities getting into the workforce and also staying in the workforce. So what small changes? So Heidi's already mentioned transportation. So are there any others that people can um, do that are pretty easy that can help get people into the workforce and also stay there? Can I speak to that? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Heidi and thank you. Um, there was another thing that I wanted to add and I'm glad that the question got raised, and thank you for the question, by the way. <clears throat> is I think it's important for our people with intellectual and disabil developmental disabilities to be able to stay in the workforce is because they can achieve those goals. Um, I know, for an example, I will use when I did work in the workforce many years ago, um, I was on contract work, and then when I would go on for about probably six to eight months. And then I would have to draw government insurance. And then I was back on the social assistance again. I'm just using those as an example. And I've had to do that three or four times and then be back in square one again. I think the alternate goal is nowadays because workforces are challenging to get employees to stay that I think they need to encourage people with intellectual disabilities and see that they are capable of working in the workforces and to try and uh, instead of relying on government resources or your own resources, try and come up with ways that can keep your 
employees there longer and, uh, and allow them to be in that workforce and to, uh, to achieve that goal so that they're not on there for five or six months or eight months and then laid off and then uh, going back again in contracts. And I know sometimes that has to be done, but an alternate goal in the long term, it needs to be that they need, employers need to look at the long term alternative of keeping people with intellectual disabilities in a paid position or a volunteer position so that they're there for the long term and not the short term. Fantastic. Nasha, Kester, is there anything else that you would like to add? So things that employers can do to retain talented people with IDD? I think um, one of the things I like to share is collaboration. I think because even when you're in the workforce here and uh, Kara brought it up, the different ability, the different the different style of working. So with me, I have to um, if to go to one of my one of my colleagues, I have to first set a meeting up. Maybe he will say or she will say, go ahead and draft up the, the document, what do you want to do? And as Carol says, sometimes it's in your head, but to put it on paper become I it's hard for me to read and write sometime or write it down. But over the past few years, um, technology has advanced, so it helps me to 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 get to, to able to do my job a little bit more easier where I can then go to my colleague set up a time, go to my colleague. As Kerry was saying, she was on point. The process is actually having someone who knows the topic. So I will have colleagues who actually have an idea of what I'm trying to go about of this document. Then they will sit with me and help me make the document much more um, presentable to take it up the up management so it can be approved or get something done. and. One of the things is accessible, te accessible technology. So to, to make sure that an employee with intellectual or development disability have the right working experience is to really help he or she with finding the right tools that will make their work experience much um, easier so they can stay at the job and they can feel like they're contributing so it wouldn't be a struggle. Fantastic. And can I can I follow up with that, Kester, and ask you about technology during COVID-19 and the pandemic when people were mainly forced to work at home? Did that make things easier or did it make it harder for people with IDD? It made it a little bit harder. I think for me, I had was to really adjust to how to go from not being around people because of what I was just mentioning. I need to work closely with people to help yeah. bounce ideas off and able to do stuff so that was very challenging for me to how to how to now do stuff virtually and get the support that I need to get my work done so getting around that it was it was and, and some of my colleague too it was pretty tough for them because now you were able to stay home you know you didn't have the social interaction with folks again so it was very hard but I think now Folks has really went over that hub. We has really fine ways. I has fine ways how to actually do my work without having a lot of colleagues around. So it's um, it was a challenging part, but it's it's now I have some better techniques of how to work with my colleagues. Fantastic. And and Nasha, can I come to you? So if you think about changes that employers can make in order to make sure that they retain talent with IDD, what changes come to mind? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Grace. Uh, actually, what companies should do, like, uh, for example, like train their staff on unified leadership. For a good example, like on our team here, as we have seen everyone on this call has uh, gone through the unified leadership. Unified leadership really helps us to, it, it really ensure that everyone in, in an organization or in company uh has got the resources uh and policies that are available in a re re easy to read format they also need to look into the workplace economics and ensure that they're inclusive uh but however it may cost a, an organization or company at the start but in the long run 
the company will benefit more. For example, we have been taught about uh, UNFA leadership. It, it talks about emotional intelligence, social awareness. So it really, uh, it really covers a lot to such an extent that, uh, uh, you know, people with IDD, they react differently uh, to, the, uh, to, to how they are exposed to. For example, if you welcome a people with IDD at a workplace or at, a, uh, at an environment, He's, he or she is able to be free and to give out the best what he is or she has. So, for example, uh, a doctor, Doctor Grace Lorden, uh, I'm new at an at a university. I'm new at your company. Uh, if you are there, if you are just quiet, I start to uh, develop that fear that uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, Dr. Grace is unapproachable. At the end of the day, I have that fear. Even if I have got something, that talent within myself, I'm, I'm not able to let it out because I've got that fear that if I do this, probably I might be chucked out. If I, so at the end of the day, for you to have more retention of the athletes or people with IDD at a common, at a workplace, create an environment that is welcoming to them, create a workforce that is also or oh, patient that is also welcoming that is that that hospitality it really goes a long way to recruit and also to retain to retain more people with idd and you see your workforce your employment sector we have more people with idd and it also increased diversity and inclusion at a workforce at a workplace thank you Thank you, Nasha. And I think one thing that you raise, which 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 is becoming much more important in COVID and after COVID, is the idea that managers and leaders need to have empathy. They need to be open and they need to be welcoming um, to their team members. Um, Heidi, is there any other advice that you would give to managers or leaders of people in organizations so that they can make sure that they're retaining talent, including people who have IDD? I think if the right training and tools were in place, <coughs> excuse me, for people with intellectual disabilities and also maybe with assistant unified partnership or a coach so that the, uh, the person can be trained properly. And once they're trained properly and be able to do the job, then you can move to the next step. I think if all those resources were there, I certainly think that the person can obtain the job and have the skills and the right things in place, they are very capable of doing it. So, and also, I think it's important at the beginning that they should volunteer or some sort of uh, paid contract so that they can see what that job is like and have that experience. Because sometimes not all people with intellectual disabilities, they might think in their mind they can do it, but actually when they do get to the workforce, then they understand what a lot of the role is and they have challenges. So maybe there's other ways that they can work with them to put them, uh, to give them another type of position rather than that one that they were thinking of. So uh, there is ways that they can do that, certainly. Thank you for the question. So I think Heidi, am I, am I right that you're agreeing with Nasha that actually taking some time at the beginning when somebody joins the company to make sure that they get set up correctly, they get the right training, really sets somebody up for success. Exactly. And that's what's very important. Fantastic. And um, for the audience as well, don't forget to ask questions. I have some more um, to get through. Um, so the next question, which is kind of a, 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 slight, a slight change of topic um, away from inclusive leadership, is talking about grit. So everybody on the phone here is a has has been an experience of being a Special Olympics athlete. We have loads of medals across the panelists. So that obviously takes a lot of grit in order to show up for training consistently and get to a place where you're not just competing, but you're also winning medals. So is there any advice for people in the audience about how to persevere when something gets hard and to be gritty like you all obviously are? Um, Kira, can I put that one to you? Yeah, of course, no worries. So talking about grit, it's interesting because that word has so much interpretation in so many ways because so many people can get so much from that. So if, when I do talks to schools, that's one of the main messages I talk to children about is saying that when things get hard, sometimes you just need to try a little bit harder 
And if you don't succeed the first time, it might come the second time you try, or the third time you try, or fourth or fifth. You know, it doesn't matter because some children might think, I need to do it now because I've been told I need to do it now. And it's saying, no, not really. You know, you can still achieve things, even though you're doing it slightly different from your friends or your fellow peers. And actually, that makes it more interesting because if it was the same way, you know, it might be a bit boring because we're all unique and we all have different ways of doing things. And that's why it's, we're so successful, even though our paths might come together at some point, we might collaborate with each other. It is really important that grit and determination because when you're in a team, you have team goals, but within that you have individual goals. So if you don't have that grit and determination, then how can you kind of help make a team succeed in their goals if you're not got that determination in there to achieve yours either? So that's what I would say to people is keep going. If it's hard, there is an end <laughs> at the end of the tunnel. You know, it will get easier. Sometimes you just got to dig hard, but there's so many benefits that come from having that grit then maybe just watch it. So that's what I'd say to that question. Thanks, Grace. Two, two things that you say here really resonated with me. So the first is, even when things are hard, keep doing a small bit, a small bit, a small bit. And the second is, don't be comparing, don't be comparing yourself to others. So just trust in the fact that if you're showing up and doing the small steps that you'll get something, you'll get something out of it. That was really, really awesome. I can see you, Nasha, um, nodding in agreement as Kira was talking. So again, I mean, you're an extraordinarily impressive individual given your accomplishments. Do you have any additional lessons for our audience on grit and perseverance? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Grace. Actually, uh, it means a lot. Somebody said aspiration without perspiration leads to desperation. Meaning to say, to gain worldwide recognition, inspiration is the key. I still remember when I started uh, to do my athletics career, I used to, I used to perform ways to that such an extent I was told that uh, you were a disgrace. But you know, I soldiered on, I trained days and nights until I become the perfect practice, made things perfect. So determination, uh, passion, it's like passion to portfolio. A Special Olympics, we change uh, our perceptions. For example, we work hard and dream big and inspire other people to follow the suit. So I just want to encourage everyone on this call that uh, even if you fail seven times, the eighth time you stand up again. And also it's all like that, that those uh, small steps that you take, uh, a journey of a thousand master begins with the one step. If you follow the river, you reach the sea. So those small steps, those small things that we do each and every day will lead us somewhere. As you can see today, I've I've got so many medals, but it starts as a small step. And in, in that journey, uh, some people didn't believe in me, but now they see me as their role model. So I always encourage young people at schools, in schools in my community to tell them that there's no shortcut to success. You have to go through each and every process, but the process is quite, uh, challenging is quite uh, hard. So in that process, you need to soldier on, you need to perceive, you never give up. It's not over until it's over. Thank you. Thank you, Nasha. Can I ask you, Nasha, have you always had a really good core self-belief so that you knew that once you keep going, that you'd end up, you know, winning, winning the medals that you've, that you've, that you've won? Uh, actually, uh, uh, I used to have that for myself, uh, but most of the people who around me, the community that I was coming from, people didn't believe in me in such an extent that people, when they have, whenever they see me training, wait that even if I hear that, I used to go and swing, but you know, I just soldiered on until I find that I can, I, I can silence the doubters. So I so just raised in such a community where no one sees the best, everyone sees the worst. So, you know, to overcome that, it takes a lot. And lo fewer people saw potential in me and he really helped me to encourage me, motivate me to work extremely hard. But truly speaking, the 
the, the community, the society was not that welcoming, was not that encouraging, but I soldiered on and other people who really helped me, few people who really helped me to have that self-belief was there, but you know, it was just more. Thank you so much. Very, very inspirational. Castor, can I, can I come to you? So we're, we're talking about resilience, grace, courage. Is there anything that you can add from a leader's perspective in order to help people who might be struggling with those aspects in their life um, to keep going? Sure. Um, I did. I did had one. Um, I had, well, fortunate enough, I had the opportunity to work with Mrs. Shriver and working with Mrs. Shriver, she was a very tough woman. And when I say tough, she always used to say to me, no, it's not an answer. And why no, it was an answer. Why no, it was, was not an answer is because people with intellectual disability often hear no. The first thing they hear is no. And as you can hear Nasha just mentioned, no, people had doubts in him. So for me, my grit comes from just going back to some of the conversation I may have with Mrs. Shriver when she started Special Olympics, how she met with a lot of uh, resistance. And now where we at with Special Olympics, back if you think of it in 1968 in Soldier Field in, in Chicago, how it was to now in, 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 in Abu Dhabi where we have 7,000 athletes and you know thousands of fans. So for me, when I hear no, that is not an, that is yes. Because I think of the men and women who are coming up behind me with intellectual disability who are gonna hear no. So if we create an organization of no's, we are not gonna be able to have people like Naja who are gonna continue facing resistance in community. So in the Special Olympics world for me, no is, <laughs> and David and other people would know, I don't really take no, but I only, no is an opportunity of how we can better things. That's what Mr. Shriver will say. Let's see how we can, maybe, how, when, let's get it done. Thank you. So can I, can I take that from Kester that if, if you were told no today, that you think about how can I change that no into a yes? Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. And Heidi, last but not least, if we think about grit, determination, and courage, is there any advice that you have for people to persevere when things might not necessarily be going their way? I don't think, I think they should not give up. Even you might have to do things a little bit differently. It's important for them to advocate for themselves. And I'm gonna use the word language because some people need to put that information in a language so that the athlete or the person with intellectual disabilities can understand it, especially when they go into the healthcare setting or in a place where they use a lot of big words. Just use simple words so that the person can understand the information that is provided to them or so that if you ask them the question, put it in words that they can understand it so that they will be able to be a part of the conversation as much as possible. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. And the last question that has come true, and I will answer it for myself first and then pass it over to you is, if you could give advice to your younger self, what would the advice be? And I, I've heard you all talk about grit. I've heard you talk about resilience. I've heard you talk about courage. And I would definitely tell my younger self to be more courageous. You know, I think I really came from a place where how people reacted to me impacted what I did and it held me back. And I think as I've got older, I've definitely have more courage and I've definitely learned some lessons from resilience and grit from you all today. Um, Kira, I'll start with you. You're still incredibly young, but I will ask you what advice you would give your younger self because I know you talk to you, you talk to kids in schools and give them some amazing advice. Yeah, I do. What I would say is, uh, as you know, I had a really bad school, you know, like upbringing, you know, I struggled. So I wasn't very academic. And what I would say to myself is don't let the words of what other people say negatively to you break you. You know, you're a lot stronger than you think. And you shouldn't believe what they're saying you know there is a meaning and there is a purpose why you're here even if you don't know that in the meaning of time actually I say to people sometimes things just happen for a reason so maybe that negative 
path was actually meant so then I could be where I am now and that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and you are not worthless you mean something and you shouldn't let those negative words cloud that positive judgment that your friends and family say to you and when a nice comment is passed your way they say oh thanks you know actually take it in it <laughs> they do actually mean it and it's not just because they're being nice to you so that's what I'd say to my younger self it's a really awesome answer thank you for that Kira um Nasha what would you what advice would you give to your younger self Are you on mute? Are you hearing me? Perfectly. Thank you so much, Dr. Grace. What I will, the advice that I'll give to my younger self is never think about what people are thinking about you. They're also thinking about you, think about them. And I will tell them to my younger self, soldier on, because difficulties are an ointment that lubricates us to our success. That's Thank amazing. you. You have an amazing way with words, Nasha. Some of the, very, very inspirational. Thank you so much. Um, Heidi, your younger self, what advice would you give to her? Well, I'm gonna say I'm a little bit older. I think I'm a person, a firm believer is I start at the bottom and work my way up. And I have done that. And I think uh, for younger generations, don't give up. You, you're going to get there someday. And you learn from your mistakes and you grow as you get older to be more patient, to be more kind and to encourage people. And even if you struggle, just keep pressing on. Fantastic, thank you for that. And Kester, you were there with the founder of the Special Olympics in the beginning and you're gonna have the last word in the panel today. What is the advice that you would give to your younger self? That was a tough question. I've been thinking about that for a minute. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with an answer, but what I'll give to the younger self. Um, I think listening. I I like, I think listening is something that I I need to do more, even though I I I will tell to my younger self, because I think if I did listen a little bit because I'm a little hard-headed, I maybe would have do something different but I wouldn't change my course of life, the way my life went. Because as Kara say, um, sometime a bad, sometimes a bad thing is sometimes a good thing. So you can't always look at the things that happen bad in your life to see it as a negative. But so I wouldn't change the, the, des the course of how my life has been, but definitely listen. Thank you so much for that, Kester. And active listening is definitely something that's important for all of us to practice more. I want to take an opportunity to thank you all for being here today. My only regret is that we're virtual and we don't get to go now and have lunch or dinner or breakfast together and continue the conversation. Um, I want to thank um, Kira Byland, Nasha Derera, Kester Edwards and Heidi Mallet for being here representing the Special Olympics today and also representing global talent because you are scattered throughout the globe. Thank you to the Special Olympics and for the London School of Economics for making this possible. And we've already had a conversation where we're going to write a piece together that will follow up on this event that will be published by the LSE Inclusion Initiative. And I'm really looking forward to working with you all on that. So thank you. It's been my absolute privilege. I've learned an incredible amount and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.